really fantastic family that joined Arapaho Road Baptist Church. Um, they came, uh, I believe it was over, it was either late spring or early summer with the intention, if memory serves, that you were going to start Denver Seminary. And that was the idea. So they drove by our church and God brought them in. And soon not only did they become members of our church, but Scott became then an intern and then a part-time youth pastor. And then you all voted him in to be our associate pastor. And then in 2018, which was um, a, a bittersweet time, we were called to be ascending church for them as they began to go and began to do the process of going over into Europe. And again, June of 2018, that does not seem like it's been that long. Now, we've had a lot of transition, COVID, and people moving out. Market has made people move out, and some of you are brand new here to the church and such, so um, you have no idea who I'm talking about or what I'm talking about, but let's fix that. Would you uh, welcome Scott and Kristen Mortar up as we get to find out what's going on with them? All right. Looks a little different. I mean, we got got the new pews and the and the and the carpet and the the whole business. What do you think? Isn't it nice? Just you just kind of sink in with these chairs. It's fantastic. I think you need to turn your mic on. <laughs> oh, they're fantastic! Yeah, really squishy. I, they were all red and maroon the last time I was in here. So it's a nice. Uh, not that there's anything wrong with that. No, no, not at all. There's no judgment call there. Right. It was That's just good. you know. But, but here we are. Well, it's good seeing you. It's it great seeing you. Right up where we, so he texted me about 7.15 because we I told him I usually get here about 7.30. And so I, I came over and uh, was able to go over to the Rutledge's. But it's good seeing you guys here. They were able to go over there and pick him up. And so we've been able to get caught up. And I know things were a little interesting with trying to get the slides together. Everything was fine until it got here. And then it wasn't fine. But how is it now? It's all good. Okay. Craig fixed it all. As, as you are prone to do, thank you, Chris. Round of applause for Chris. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> he, he took a bow, and it, and it was well-deserved. That, that's good. I appreciate you, brother. So, uh, uh, so I caught us all up to 2018. Yeah. I'll just, I'll just hand the baton off to you, and you can catch us up <clears throat> okay. on how things have been. Do you want me to go for that? All right. Uh, so, yeah, 2018. We, I resigned, and then we all moved over to Michigan to round up our, our partner development. So one of the things, uh, if you are in the Southern Baptist world, or if you have been for most of your life, you know that the IMB is the main missionary entity that sends out missionaries. Uh, at the place that we were going to go, which was initially Belfast, I mean, not Belfast, well, that was one thing, the place that I did want to go, but then Galway, Ireland, um, the IMB just weren't weren't focusing on that area, so we went to another agency, which is here in Colorado, World Venture, and they were willing to send us there, uh, or just at least um, carry along, and the church is the one who sent us, and all our partners. Right. So we had to raise our own support, and that alone actually was an incredible ministry, like we grew so much, and we got we were able to share with so many people the amazing thing God's done in our lives, is doing in our lives, and was going to do in our lives mm -hmm. in Ireland at that time. Because we raised 100% of our support under the uh, impression that we were going to go to Galway, Ireland to plant a church outside of Galway, Ireland in Oranmore. Mm -hmm. uh, but God had other plans. So once we were in Michigan, we started to raise the support and getting real close and we applied for our visa and were denied. And we were like, what? What's going on here? So, and then uh, we appealed, applied again, it denied. And we're like, okay, God, what are you doing here? 100% supported, all ready to go. Mm -hmm. Everyone's, we got all fans, you know, got everyone cheering. And uh, we can't get in. So we prayed and our agency reached out, gave us a number of different options. And one option in particular really suited our interests and our, and our abilities and our skills and all that. And that was uh, London. So 
the London, I'm going to show you a lot of different slides and pictures and things. Right. So it's not the kind of London that you're thinking in your head. Let me get you that. Let's get that straight. I guarantee you it's going to be something <laughs> different. Uh, unless you've been to East London, particularly, then you know. Um, but <laughs> that place, we didn't even know until we went there. So mm -hmm. we, didn't, we weren't able to go on a vision trip, which usually that's what you do as missionaries. You go there and check it out first. Uh, but because COVID, again, here's a T-shirt idea for everybody if you want to make some money. Just because COVID, all right? So there we go. Um, <laughs> I swear, I, I got to make that T-shirt. Um, but yeah, because of COVID, we couldn't go. So we just, we just said, you know what? Let's just, let's just move there. So we moved there with a number of different options of how we were going to go about getting the visa when, when we were there. So there's a, there were ways to do that. So we went out. And we arrived in London in, on uh, July 7th, 2020, mm. and went from there. So that's how we got to London. Okay. Does that answer your question? That answers. So I guess the question I have for all of you, I know I have a certain way of when I think about London, I think of Big Ben and, exactly. you know, the yeah, stuff yeah, like yeah. that. Paddington have any of you ever there. been to East London? Like the eastern part, like the what, what was the act, what was the actual little the city you were in was it was forest it was something? Well, it was it's a borough like the, of London called oh, Newham. Okay, and then Newham, too. You go ahead. You were gonna you were gonna no, do the geography. Right. Oh, but then what? And then what after Newham? Forest Gate. Yeah, Forest, Forest Gate. Gate. Yeah. Yeah. So there's nine boroughs, and this one is primarily immigrants mm -hmm. and poor yeah. people. So uh, historically, everything beyond the river, which is right there, it's kind of like there's a river here going uh, north-south, mm -hmm. and then the Thames goes east-west. Um, well, actually, it flows east, but everything on that side of the river, mm -hmm. the graveyards, the trash, before anybody lived there, that's where it would go. Right. So this whole area of East London is primarily immigrants and, and those who work blue collar jobs. Yeah, why don't we see some pictures? Let's see what they. Can, yeah, can we, do we can go into uh, our whole journey and yep. just kind of show you like what we got um, going here. So, Great. If, Craig, if you want to throw up slide number one. Um, oh, we didn't even need this. this it's is right not there. East London. So this is. This is a place, we, we met this incredible young couple, well, they're not young, they were old, but they felt young. Um, they, they retired and they moved to a place way far away from East London. <laughs> so uh, they, they spent their, all their years doing great ministry and work there, so we were visiting them, but that was just a good picture of our family. So is Rory standing on something besides you, or is that really how tall no, he that, is No, he's now? on the ground. No, he's yeah. standing right there. On he's the, standing yeah. right the same no, spot No, he's very are, tall, though. He is taller Let's than make you. it very clear that Rory and Scott are standing on the same platform. Yeah. So that is legitimate. I think the platform well, is Well, tell us about your kids real quick, because I don't think everybody yeah. knows. So them. Rory's 14 now. He's six foot tall. He is in the drama yeah, club at school, exactly. yeah. Just about to begin driver's training, which terrifies me. Um, You're such a mom. I'm such a mom. You're such a mom. I know. But and yeah. then um, Piper, she is in, she's 12. She's in seventh grade now. Um, all the drama. Mm. And then we have Baron, and he is in fifth grade. He's 10, and he's on the football team. So he's very good at that. He'll go around and proudly tell you that football is very good for his aggression issues. So <laughs> the problem is we can't get him to tackle people. So we're like, okay, we'll take it out on people then. Like, it's okay. He says, Dad, you've been telling me my whole life not to hit people. <laughs> and now you're telling me to do that. So yeah, he's got he's, an internal struggle. He's conflicted. Struggle. <laughs> he's yeah. conflicted. And then Josie, I mean, all of you who know Josie, he is 100% self-proclaiming mama's boy. So if mommy's there, he is happy, and he loves to be the center of attention. And how old is he now? He's seven. He's in first grade, awesome. so he loves it. Yep. Okay. That's great. We can move on to the next one. So this is our house uh, that we moved in, 160 Plashet Grove. 
Uh, that's where our address was, and that's our little abode there when we first moved in. And uh, if you want to just go to the next slide, this, that's our garden. It's kind of like a, you know, the new iPhones have like the expansive view. Mm. It wouldn't look like that without the filter there. <laughs> but, but that was the actual sunset. There's no filter for that sunset. I mean, well, sunrise. I thought it was beautiful. Um, and so that's our little garden area, and our neighbor lived right next door. Uh, that's Gavin, and uh, we got to meet Gavin and his family, made really good friends really fast. Right. A very, he knew about God, understood stood who God was, but not fully. He's never really been in the Bible, but eventually him and his uh, girlfriend at the time, Verlene, we had him over for a real American Thanksgiving which was... They had never had pumpkin pie before, and guys, I never. knocked it out of the park. Like, yeah. it was the best pumpkin pie I've ever made, and yeah. they're never going back. <laughs> right. But we eventually invited them to church, and they started coming to church, and I was doing some Bible study with them, bought them Bible, but in the end, we, he never came to Christ that, that I know of at this moment, but he is a soul that please pray for. Right. Gavin is an incredible guy, has a lot of anxiety issues, but he um, is just amazing, amazing guy. And uh, we were just blessed to have him as a neighbor. And he was crying when we left. So uh, one of our other neighbors is, uh, well, I guess that's the next slide. There's JJ and Baron in their school uniforms. They're pretty cute kids. Uh, yeah, they, they all went to British school, so they all wore uniforms. I didn't have a picture of Piper and Rory's. They had to wear ties, which was great. It was like so, Harry Potter uniforms. Yeah, they good. all four of them though they were the only Americans in their school. Mm-hmm. And in the boys' school they ever, were ever. ever. And then they were the I was the only white mom that came to pick up. So well, like, I got a video to show. And me. the tallest. And so they're like, Mom, we can always see you, you're right back there. That's <laughs> like yes, just I just stands out like a bright light. I all did. right, here's here's the video pick Here's up. a little video of pick up just to show you kind of like how things looked there. We have some more videos as well. Um, this is just our line. and uh, So this is almost uh, demographically the exact opposite of Denver. Exact opposite. <laughs> it was like 97% Muslim. Yeah. And if you weren't Muslim, you were Hindu or, or Sikh or something Hindu like that. Or you were Hindu or Sikh. There were in a number of different Eastern religions as well. Mm-hmm. So that was that's a, probably a that could there have been there's the right. there's the man <laughs> there he is so I could have, that could have been a challenge I mean it, it seems like that yeah. would have been a challenge for you as wife missionary mom mm-hmm. woman mm-hmm. yeah it was really tough so like I've always thought of myself as like a modest person I don't think I have ever dressed scandalously on purpose <laughs> but like the so Muslims there hold Americans at a higher standard because Americans are Christians. So it doesn't matter even if you're not a Christian and you're American. They yeah, they associate Americans with Christianity. So when, I, when we were over there, even one of Baron's little friends, or Josie's little friend, Safia, she's like, I really like you and Josie. I love to talk with you. She goes, I wish I could come to JJ's house, but I'm not allowed to go into Christians' homes. And so there was definitely like you can tell there's a difference, like a distance. It took them a long time to get to know me and to trust me and to want to talk to me. Um, and the, it's just weird. Like you have to be covered from head to toe all the time. So it was, it was different for me because the American in me is like, no, if I want to wear shorts because it's 95 degrees outside, I want to wear shorts. But on those days, that's like, there were times where I was hit in the arm with a rolled up newspaper, I was spat at, I was called a whore, all these other things just because I had short sleeves on or my ankles were showing. She would get hit on like all the not time. Nicely. Not nicely. Yeah, so, not the nice hit on. Yeah. That, so, or that type of hit on. And Piper and I were like, followed yeah. in stores because we didn't wear head coverings and so we were a theft threat to them. Like they thought we were just there to rob them because we didn't have head coverings on. So Yeah, because if you're white and you live in that neighborhood, you're either a drug addict or you're a criminal Mm -hmm. to some degree. So that's a stereo. It's kind of like a reverse. Yeah. Yeah. So us being there was very odd. It's very localized (laughs) to just that neighborhood. Like if you go 20 minutes and go to Stratford where the mall is, 
you don't feel that at all. So we spent a lot of time at Stratford. <laughs> well, <laughs> there, there was a, we spent a lot of time in Stratford because of a number of different reasons, but yeah. we did spend a lot of time in our house, I mean, our neighborhood as well because yes. that's where we lived but and where the church was. <laughs> this is just showing it. Like, we, we went to a lot of people's houses in our church, and we never had a car, so we'd always take the underground or a bus. So I was just, I thought this was a great picture because one of the, kids' favorite thing to do is when we get on the underground very late at night after having a dinner at someone's house, the train would be empty. And while it was going, they would just run up and down the whole train. It was, they had a blast. They were not allowed to do during the day. (laughs) No, you can't get a spot standing during the day. And then the next one, this is just Rory. I just wanted to get a little closer to look of uh, who Rory is and for people who have not met him. He's he loves into. Asian food too, so that's why he's by Chinatown because his favorite thing is to go get dumplings or like soy sauce and rice or something. So, so getting into, I just wanted to first off, I just wanted to show you our kids, show you like a little bit, but we're gonna get a little bit more into sure. the neighborhood and things like that, and actually the ministry now that we're we're doing. So, what this is, God has His plan set out. He He plans our paths. We think sometimes that we're going in one direction but as long as we're following him we're going in the right direction but it's not always the end that we end up in hence the reason why i mean we're here and we didn't expect that so we've had a lot of unexpected conclusions and one of them is when the the ministry that we initially signed on to in london was was not exactly what we had thought was gonna was the ministry so when we got there, we were very disillusioned and, and questioning a lot of long nights, a lot of tears, a lot of struggle, um, not only with having to say goodbye to London, I mean to Ireland and our team that we were going to go plant with, but now we're in London that we've never been to, and the ministry that we were told was there was not there. So, which was a very strange uh, experience, if you were, if you could think about it. So, uh, I did my due diligence for about three months to try to figure out what was going on, uh, but it came to the conclusion that I was not th- that they did not want me to do that, and nor did World Venture or anything. So, we were almost going to come home and have this little discussion about three months right. in. And we were just devastated, honestly, like all that we went through. And we were praying, and we were like, you know, we were sitting there and going, we really just need to find a good church to go worship and just get poured into. So actually, an IMB missionary family, which we'll show pictures of you, became one of our best friends. So they were fantastic. Um, The only reason why they were there is because one of their kids got sick in India so they had to be around a hospital that was good enough for his illness. So that's why he, they were in, in East London. Um, but they told us to go to this church called East London Tabernacle. It was planted by Charles Spurgeon. And it had real, yeah, you, you know it. You should. Yeah. You know, I'm yeah. Just, <laughs> yeah, I've heard of him. Uh, so it was a solid church. And the first day we were there, I turned the corner and literally bumped into the lead pastor. His name's Ken Burnell. And uh, he was instrumental in all of this. And he was from America. He was a, from Boston. Boston, yeah. But he did not have a Boston accent anymore because he had lived in London for over 30 years. His wife was British, or is British. And uh, he, he immediately just asked me, started asking me questions and just said, you need to come to my office. We need to talk, you know, like what's going on. Right. And uh, I showed up that Tuesday and told him the whole situation of what happened, just how devastated we were. And he said, you know what, you need to meet Martin, this guy named Martin Oriaki. And initially I thought he was Japanese, because that sounds Japanese, but he was Nigerian, so there you go. Um, I'll show you, there's a picture of him, we'll be on here soon. So what Martin had a ministry going is right in our neighborhood, like right there where we were, he was doing exactly what we thought the ministry was going to be when we initially got there, but with a different group of people. And 
I started talking to him in our first meeting at Starbucks. We actually were asked to leave after six hours. Um, How, which, six hours? It was a six hour meeting. Yeah. I thought he'd been abducted. <laughs> <laughs> we could have went longer. Yeah. Uh, but we were, you guys can, are you guys okay? Those yeah. talks sound familiar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They yeah. do. They it's do. good. Um, so we, we just hit it off right away. Theologically, methodologically, miss, missiologically, all that. We were just right on the same page. We were ready to go. So we prayed about it. About a week after that, we said, hey, let's let's join forces, you know, like, let have, are you, are you okay with me coming in and being a partner, Martin? And he said, yeah. And I said, well, there's one issue. I don't have a visa. I need a visa. The plan was, is through our, our other situation that they were working on that, but that was another thing that wasn't happening. Right. Um, so that was a layer of the disappointment as well. So Martin got right on it. And, uh, I'll tell you about that in a second, but what I want to first do is just show you what the church looks like. So Ridley Community Church, that's the building. Um, Ridley Community Church started in the 1800s, and in 1910, the church got very small. So they ended up giving the building to London City Mission, which is a big overarching mission that's been going to, from the 1800s as well. But one of the main things that they wanted to make sure that happened was that a church still met there, that it wasn't only a building for activities uh, or outreach or anything like that. They wanted a church to be there. So there was a church there for a little while, but then in the 60s, 70s, it kind of it died, and then they never had one. But they wanted to start a new one, so they actually asked East London Tabernacle if they had anybody that could come over and start a new church, kind of take the people that were there, yeah. because there was a lot of like volunteers and things like that would just show up, so all those people ended up joining the church. Can I interject? Absolutely. For like three years straight, they had missionaries that would come in on different Sundays, so if you can imagine for three years, every Sunday, all you hear is the gospel presentation, so like it, it, they were getting fed, but they were getting the fed the same message over and over and over again, so... It was good that Martin was able to come and like start, you know, it says in the Bible, you know, you go from the milk to the solid foods and these people were definitely ready and hungry for the solid foods. So. Oh, it was amazing seeing their eyes open wide and just the smiles on their faces and comments after sermons, not only my own Martin's as well and anyone else who was preaching, hmm. they'd come up to us and just say, I never knew that about the Bible. That's incredible. And it was things that a lot of us take for granted. Uh, they don't have a lot of that deeper teaching in those areas because largely it's only missionaries, which is, um, we're not knocking on that because right. that needs to happen as well, but both need to happen, right. Right? right? So that was what the situation was there. So Martin came in and we came in as like about two and a half years after Martin had started, but he was doing everything on his own. And uh, that's where I stepped in to help. So if you want to play that little video, just to show you, like, this is just a... So this building actually was destroyed by a bomb in 1940 in the Blitz in World War II. Mm. So it says, destroyed by bombs, 1940, built to the glory of God, 1951, right? Is that what that says? Yeah, that's mm -hmm. right. Yeah. Uh, so that is Ridley Church. Right next door is a Sikh temple. And then about three doors down is a mosque that is one of the busiest mosques in East London. Uh, we had about 14 mosques in about a half mile radius of our house and one, one church, which is Ridley. Wow. Well, there were other Baptist churches, but we found out very, yeah. very quickly that Baptist in the UK does not mean Baptist in America. Yeah. So, like, that these are very progressive and very, like very progressive churches very left yeah if you know what that means okay we don't need to go into no. that but the, no. yeah so baptist in the uk is not baptist. if you have any questions we'll be we'll, yeah. we'll, we'll hang around <laughs> make sure yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, but technically east london tabernacle is baptist yeah but they don't use that and ridley also is baptist but right. we don't yeah. use it right so how about uh, that for just so people don't get confused that's, I mean, that was just the nature of East London, right? Or actually London and England. 
But the next picture is Martin and I. There he is. There he is. We, we immediately met. And what, did, what was everyone saying? They were ebony and ivory. They're like brothers from another mother. Yeah. <laughs> That's what his wife, uh, Elizabeth, said. It's like ebony and ivory. Yep. So we were like, I mean, we're the same height, bald head, gray beards. Beautiful. I love it. <laughs> it was so good. So we just clicked right away. And he's one of my uh, just best friends. So we, we just talked on Zoom a little bit ago and, and it was just devastating to leave him but he's got an amazing family and, and so this is the church inside the church this is a video Craig so I think you might just have to press play on there that there you go there just to show you we, we used YouTube because there's nobody that can play instruments so we use the screen and uh, YouTube for all our our singing so this was like a, a regular Sunday which is actually very well attended on this Sunday if it was attended well, including Zoom, it would be about 40 people, which is actually incredibly large for London and England in general. Uh, the average is about 25 people per congregation. And you can see in the video, you might notice that nobody's mouths are moving, not even under their masks, because in the UK, we weren't allowed to sing on Sundays with church. So the reason everybody's swaying so much and dancing so much and we would put our hands up and everything was because that was the only form of worship we had. We could read and listen to the music and you could hum very, very quietly, but their singing wasn't allowed. The government said we couldn't. Boris Johnson yeah. said no. But yeah. you could go to a soccer game with 60,000 people and, and wear cheer. no shirt and cheer. Mm -hmm. But yeah, see, but there, that's the difference. It's a very... Religion is not seen as a right. It's more of like they tolerate it. A lot of influence comes from France, which a French atheist told me this, that I met. I actually had a group of French atheists that I hung out with about monthly <laughs> and talked to. They were great. They were in their 20s. I don't know what they were doing with me, but we got along. Hey. So, <clears throat> hey. But they were saying, no, in France, it's not freedom of religion, it's freedom from religion. Right, right. So it's, they have the right to have you not talk to them about Jesus. So that has carried over to England, especially amongst the British. Um, <clears throat> not, not the immigrants, necessarily, because they're bringing in their own culture. But that, it's what makes it such an such a unique place because you have so many different worldviews coming together to where we would actually have an alliance with Muslims when it came to school, not in a way where we would work with them, but I'm saying ideologically and, and theologically because the schools there would have, a, a, what's it called? Drag, drag day? Well, it drag was, was cross-dressing week. Cross so like, dressing they week. were promoting LGBTQ plus in all the elementary and secondary schools, so f primary and secondary. And so for a week, you would, well, they called it something else, though, because it sounded innocent, but what they would encourage boys to dress as girls, girls to dress as boys, and do all these things. Well, the one reason that we were very grateful that there were a lot of Muslims at our school was because Muslims do not stand for that, that it's against what they believe. And that's what and I so, meant by yeah. yeah. So that's <laughs> yeah, where we were that, kind of like, yeah. we're okay being at your school. Well, yeah, <laughs> because our kids they, don't have to deal with that. Yeah, you would find those similarities sometimes, even though you knew that most other things, where they derived that, that moral principle from was different. Yeah. Um, but there's still an advocate in that area. But one of the most important things I wanted to do this morning was show you the people that we had at the church and then also later on. So I'll let you do the yeah. women. So this is, right? these are our friends, Ava and Irina. They are both from Slovakia. And they will tell you every time, oh, Americans, you are so much like us. <laughs> so like you talk about American hospitality, these women will cook you any type of food you want and make you, like we would go to Irina's house and she would make an, a, a Slovakian meal with pizza, with chicken nuggets, with pizza something was else. Pizza appetizer. And then she, yeah, pizza was an appetizer. <laughs> and then she'd have this full on rice meal afterwards. <laughs> so we always Delicious. were stuffed when we left Irina's house. But wow. They were great. They were both former Catholics that had come to faith. Um, yeah. Yeah. And this is Carol. This is Irina's uh, husband. He just came to faith very recently and actually started to just get into uh, church and all that. And he started attending a lot more 
because of the friendship that we developed with them. So that's Carol. And then next, this is Turgai. So Turgai is, works with London City Mission. So he's a leader in the area because he's a Muslim convert. Um, he used to be Muslim. He grew up Muslim in Turkey. And uh, he has an amazing testimony. I would love to get it on video for you guys to watch. Uh, just incredible stuff. But he is an amazing evangelist incredible person and his wife Yilsh. this is Yilsh. um so when her and her guy were married they were an arranged marriage because they were both muslim so their families arranged for them to get married and, and they didn't like each other they did not like each other at all <laughs> and it was very very because in muslim culture you as most of you know the men make the rules and the women do all the cleaning and everything else so um they had a, a lot of struggle in their marriage but then christ just brought them both together after they were both saved so they have a beautiful marriage now and beautiful children and even more beautiful grandchildren, so. <laughs> and we'll go next. This is Alan. This is the, one of the young slash old people that we knew because he was very young at heart. Um, he is a politician, a businessman, but always made it a, a commitment to live in the Muslim community in East London his whole life, wow. which is incredible because he had money, he had the accent, because all the, you can always tell who's from a rich area by their accent. Um, it's not East, Eastern London accent. That's He's the one that would correct our grammar all the time. He's like, I'm sorry, what language do you speak? That's English, right, that's English, right. Yeah, from exactly. England. <laughs> He'd say it jokingly, I think, I think, all right. Um, all right, this guy uh, is Ashan. Ashan is a Booz, uh, Buddhist convert. Him and his wife actually escaped Sri Lanka because they were from different tribes and they weren't allowed to marry each other, and they did, so they came here. But he stopped coming to the church a little bit because he had a lot of visa issues because he was trying to get refugee status, and it was tough. But pray for Ashan. He's an amazing guy. He loves kids. God. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this is Sonia. Sonia Tell is, Sonia. Um, so what you'll find in a lot of London is Jamaican British people. So her mom lives in Jamaica, um, but she lives in London. And she, you know, she's a D done. She was the D done of Ridley. She is the heart and soul. She's the person that's my, like, you know, she a does. A little bit of Diane West. A little bit of Diane West. Yeah. <laughs> I think we can get Kelly in there too on that one. Maybe just a bit. She is ARBC friendly, yeah. so you know, she was the she person that was smiling. Her. She would greet you at the door and talk to you, and she had me over for coffee a lot, so she's a lot of fun. You're everywhere. You're you everywhere. guys are everywhere. How wonderful. How wonderful. <laughs> uh, this is Peter. He was a character, I'll tell you that. He was awesome. He, when, when he was a little kid, I remember the beginning of uh, Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, where they all had to escape London the kids did on trains. He was one of them. He was very little when he did it, but he remembers bits and pieces of it. But he didn't, he was a man of very few words, but when he spoke, it was either very, very insightful and thoughtful, or it was absolutely hilarious. Just one, I should have put the picture of the watch up there, but he came up to me in, in this amazing British accent, and just goes, Scott, I can't do it. I'm not even gonna try. Do you know do who you, Biggie Smalls is? Do you know who Biggie Smalls is. <laughs> <laughs> and if none of you know, that's an East Coast gangster rapper. All right. Yeah, it was just like, yeah. Whoa, yeah. Why are you asking me that? And he pulled up his sleeve, and there it was—a watch covered in fake diamonds with Biggie Smalls on it. Are you? He had what? no idea who what? it was, but he said it looked cool, so he bought it from a guy on the street. It was so funny. He's just a joker like that. He loved weird stuff like that. Yeah, so. that doesn't fit. No, that, that, no, that you'd never fit. think it would come from him. But And most of the time, he was decked in a full-on suit that was made out of the London flag. Yeah. So he yeah. had oh, the no mask fit. to go with it. Talk about patriotic. Oh, yeah. He was in he the was newspaper not afraid a few to times. It. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the next, uh, this is Raju. Uh, I don't have a picture of Suzanne. Suzanne's, uh, her, his wife. I mean, his wife, sorry, uh, his wife, and both of them 
came to Christ later on in life. He was a Baha'i, which if you know, um, Baha'i is like a sect. Of, it's like a, almost like a Mormon to a Christian is, is a Baha'i is to uh, a Muslim. So it's kind of like a different angle with prophets and stuff. Um, he was Baha'i, and as was his son, Raman, which both of them came to faith about 10 years ago. So they're developing Christians. Um, this is Martin's son, Nathan, hmm. who is an incredible musician and uh, just an all-around great kid. So I just wanted to show you some of the, the youth there. Obviously, not all the people in the church are in these pictures, but this is your IMB missionaries. Yeah. All right? So I hope, and I'm trying to get it arranged, that one day you'll be able to meet these guys. Because they still go to this church. They just joined. Um, we invited them, and we were like, why don't you join up? You know, like, because the, the ministry that Ridley was doing is exactly the kind of ministry that they were doing anyway. So I'm like, come. And so they did. And we just hit it off amazing. You and Jennifer were just like. Jennifer helped me with homeschooling. As most of you know, I love my children, but I never had a heart for homeschooling. And then with um, COVID and us moving, we I made the decision that, with everything around us changing to keep stability in our home, we needed to homeschool our kids so that one thing was a constant. And so for two years, I homeschooled my kids, and I met Jennifer, and it was so nice to homeschool with her because she would help me navigate everything. Mm. But, but then I went to school. But then I put my kids in school, and she felt like I abandoned her. <laughs> in a nice but way. In a nice way. Yeah. Um, Jennifer has an amazing ministry with um, Muslim women in our neighborhood. She would take them, they would all take a 45-minute train ride and meet secretly in the food court of a shopping mall because if the husbands found out that the women were having a Bible study, they would be beaten or killed. And so it was an underground women's Bible study, and she also... In London. In London. Which she'd never really think of. And then she also um, has a ministry where she does henna tattoos on women's hands, and she can present the whole gospel presentation or any Bible story that you would like to share and how God worked that Bible study through the art of henna. And if you live in eastern London, where the Southeast Asians are, henna is instrumental in a lot of the things that they do. So if they see that you have henna on your hand, they will come and ask you about it and want to talk to you about it. So she had an amazing ministry with that. And Has an amazing ministry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Aaron does a lot of that work as well, which a lot of this is getting integrated into Ridley as well. So right. hopefully in the long run, what we did, what the IMB is doing through Aaron and Jennifer will all kind of coalesce and, and, and come together and where ARBC could possibly be still involved in the ministry That'd be good. That, we, that we were a part of, which would be fantastic. But Aaron does a lot of door knocking, a lot of evangelism, street corner ministry. He's just always out there. And they have and three kids. They, they have Silas, who was the baby that was born. He was born with um, gangrene in his intestines and was hospitalized for a long time. Then they have Simeon, who has speech delay and asthma, but he is, thank, praise the Lord, being able to heal from that. And then they have a beautiful daughter named Naomi. And, yeah, they're great kids. Yeah, it's great. Um, so, and then the next, this is uh, Graham. Graham is a Christian, I believe. I believe that he, he loves God, but I he is sanctific the idea of sanctification and how to live Christ like is is not there at the moment and he would admit that to you so we we hung out and talked a lot me and Graham he actually lost his 18 year old son got hit by a truck um, and uh, his wife cheated on him as well and just everything in his life just fell apart and so he went to the bottle. And so he is now uh, a recovering alcoholic mm -hmm. and just leaning on the Lord. He's, and he's an incredible baker, I'll tell you that. He almost joined the Great British Baking Show, and instead he just started bringing it to church. So I benefited yeah. every Sunday. <laughs> he's that good. He could be that on good. that. And then uh, just, uh, just one, other get, one other person that meant a ton to me. But, yeah, I have like four pictures of him. So. This is John Boudiget. Boudiget. Okay. So he actually was born in Tunisia. So his running joke with the pastor, who's Nigerian, he's like, us Africans. <laughs> 
So he's yes, really he, he's really Maltese, but anyway, he's very funny. You can go on. But yeah, John, John was a, a Catholic later on, in, I mean, earlier on in life, and then eventually came to the faith. And uh, he is that guy that you need in your church, right? He's like the Gene Willenbrick, right? He's the guy who's always around doing stuff. Can fix anything. Right, Gene? You know it. That's <laughs> your, yes, I'll call you out. You, you know, uh, <laughs> It's a good thing. He's the guy that does, he's just the handyman. Yeah. You know, he just does everything. So, um, And so John is an amazing guy, and we had so many times where we sat there and talked, but he's also a joker. He loves joking. So we had a goodbye, farewell lunch. And uh, he, he made this cake. There's a zoomed in. He lo- look how red he is from laughing. Yeah, okay. Goodbye there, there's a, there's and the good close up. He loved that. He thought Man, it was so Man, it sounds so like funny. you all had a great relationship. Oh, yeah, that was good. Yeah. It was good. He brought us to the airport. I was just texting him the other day. Um, and we still keep in contact. And he's just amazing. So. Okay. So you, you, you have spent some time telling us just how much yeah. this has meant to you. Um, you're here. You're, you're here. You're, you're not back in Michigan. Yeah, um, there's, a, there's a few other things about ministry. I don't know yeah. if you want us to keep yeah, going. Go, how go how long it. do we have? Well, I mean, we, we usually get out around two. two. We usually get out around, at around two, yeah. <laughs> so I thought... Those of you who know my husband know he's not known for being short-winded. <laughs> It's very long-winded. It's soon, right? What now? The end? It, we're getting close. Yeah. Okay. All yeah. right. We're good. But um, we're okay. I mean, we're okay. We've already seen it. We're okay. Well, yeah, I mean, skip through. Yeah. That's just a good picture. I mean, some of you are yours. shaking your heads at me, but I think well, we will be okay. <laughs> right? Okay. No, just, just really quickly. So yeah. one of the, the amazing, this is a God thing, though, right? Yeah. So this guy, his name is Teo Ariaki. No, Teo are acquired. I don't yeah, know how to say his last name, yeah. so it's very close. It's very close. It's a very difficult Nigerian name, um, but he's Nigerian as well, but he's also the, the head of Langham, which is John Stott's ministry that he started in England. Right. Um, he's right. the one that actually was able to get us a visa. So, okay. yeah, he's the guy. So I would go to my office, which is the next picture. I just, there's my office. I would go one day a week. It would be an hour train ride. That was how I had to fulfill my visa ob- obligations uh, for the government. So I had to stay there, and, and I just studied during that time. But that was an amazing story because w- the day we were supposed to leave from our, our visitor visa, that night we turned in our visa application. And as long as you have the visa application in, you can stay. Yeah. Incredible. Wow. It was by the day, by the hour, really. So, um, just we'll skip through real quick. Just some of the things we did: Muslim engagement training. We did Muslim dialogue, Muslim Christian dialogue, where we were able to share um, what what the Bible said about a particular topic, and then the Muslims would go, and we would go. It wouldn't be a debate necessarily because Muslims almost definitely don't like to debate in East London. They don't like that, but they will just discuss with you. So we took that opportunity and we discussed a lot with some of the imams in the, in the neighborhood. And then we would have upwards of 80 Muslims on Zoom calls wow. and in live as well. Wow. And then just really quick, just go through. This is just our neighborhood. I took some photos one morning, so there's not a lot of people. This is just some, these are just some images of our daily walk to church. If you wanted to look like Aladdin, we could make that happen. Oh, yeah, right, yeah well, that's coming up. Don't worry. All right there. I, I like to say Sultan, Sultan. where. Yeah. Um, that's, well, that looked like a Davy Crockett type of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, but yeah that could, wasn't quite. That's that wasn't quite turban. Yeah. That's all the clothing you could buy, and then there was the women version of it. That's okay. all of the, I had to travel or buy my clothes it. online. <laughs> yeah. So, okay. This is a little area that's usually packed full of people. I was going to church really early in the morning, but, and this is like, there's a lot of these signs, and the next one too is we stay right. with Palestine. There's a lot of that kind of push is right. there as well. Not surprising. This is right. a good video. This is a park, three houses, I mean, three minutes from our, 
our house. And this is actually uh, during COVID. So they were having mm. an outside uh, call to prayer mosque or like a call to prayer. Right. And that's, look how many people are there. Rory went Christians. to go for a walk one day to get out of the house because we were in strict lockdown for months. And so he's like, Mom, you would not believe what I just walked into. <laughs> and so just like hundreds upon hundreds of Muslim men gathering and listening to someone read the Quran and then to go into prayer afterwards. And then uh, just real quick, this, uh, I see I keep saying real quick because it's, it's really important that I get to the finish because the last guy is, the most, is one of the most important. Gotcha. This is another video, Craig. You just want to hit this. It's only like 20 seconds. This is Stratford. This is the area that if you ever wanted to feel any sense of America or Western culture, really, <laughs> you took a 10-minute bus ride to Stratford where their mall was in a, in a train station. Um, and the diversity there is just incredible. It's just, there's so much. During, down in that little mall that the video first started at, that's every Saturday, every Sunday, packed full of street preachers, Muslim evangelists, bad rappers, um, singer, you know, just like people just doing things all over the place. It was Romanian incredible. gypsies begging for money. <laughs> right, but it was an amazing opportunity to share the gospel. Yeah. Right. You know, they, I, every time they'd come up to me, I'd go, I'll listen to your thing if I get to tell you something after. And that's how I would do it. So I'd listen to theirs, and then I'd be like, all right, my turn. Let's go. So we would talk about Jesus. That's good. And, uh, and then, so really, this is what, I, this is the last picture. This is Iqbal. Iqbal is one of the guys that our method of, min, of evangelism was broad with uh, outreach, like door knocking and things like that. But also what we really wanted to make sure we paid attention to was those daily tasks that you go do. Right. We didn't have a car, so I'd walk to church every day, and I'd pass this this convenience store there all over the place. And I'd always go to his store. And I started building a relationship with him, and I learned about his past, his son, his mom, his wife, his daughters, his old job. His I, I knew I know everything about Iqbal. He knows so much about me. I one the one person I wanted my my mom to meet when she got here was definitely Iqbal. So my mom, when I go, come on, mom, you got to meet Iqbal. And uh, he's Muslim and, and still is. He never came to Christ. But the last letter I sent him was full of the gospel. And uh, I am praying daily that God will just take his heart and change it. And I've recruited Martin to now go to Iqbal's store every day. He'd be so, good. He'd be good. <laughs> but uh, I hope every one of you have an Iqbal. All right? Get that one person. You might check checkout clerk. Just pray <laughs> for him. And love Kroger. him. And bring him gifts. And he brought me gifts. And he gave me these chocolate bars all the time and stuff. But anyway, that's really the heart of the ministry. I miss yeah. that so much. But... God called us home. The great thing is, is like what you were saying earlier, yeah. you can do it anywhere. Mm -hmm. So we can just do it in Michigan now. Speaking of Michigan, so what, what brought you home? What prompted you to leave this ministry? To, it's very clear that you left a big piece of your heart there. So what, what prompted you to come home? You want to start that one? Um, I think a lot of it is like when you're overseas, I, th I think some of you know, Piper had suffered from six months of insomnia and anxiety. And when you hit that realization that your kid's spiritual growth is more important to you than anything else and stuff, that was one of the reasons, like, um, we just realized that our kids needed family and stability. Rory would come to us and say, please don't ever move me again. I don't think I could handle another move. The thing was, we were only there for a year, on a year visa with only an opportunity for another year. So that meant that in the middle of high school, I was gonna have to move him again. And I couldn't guarantee him I wasn't gonna be able to move him again. And um, that bothered me and that bothered him. And we just started praying about like, God, what are you doing here? Like Rory was our, well, if any of you know him, he was on board to become a missionary. He was very pro us going on the mission field. So for him, our rock solid kid that was always up for anything right. to be wavering like that was a, it was like, okay, I need to start He listening. was struggling there too. He was. 
Um, also, like, you guys saw the pictures, but it was not a safe neighborhood. Our kid's schoolmate was stabbed to death on the way home one day by another teenager. There was a lot of drugs and prostitution. Baron almost, got abducted. Baron almost was abducted by a man on the street. So it was just... The people would do meth right in the phone booth, right outside our house. We had people die over drug overdoses. It was not a safe area. And um, they, were, they were fearful. Baron was afraid yeah. all the time, constantly looking over his shoulder that somebody was going to try to grab him. Um, so I think that was, that was when I was like, Scott and I need to really focus on our family. And then we got other word from our family in Michigan that just really needed to be seen to and ministered yep. to. Yep. And then our visa yeah. is just kind of coming to a close. And, and the cost of the visa yeah. is anything that, beyond anything that I ever imagined. Mm-hmm. Which we it was knew upwards God could provide, of $20,000 right? <laughs> to get a visa yeah. for one year. That's not pocket change, is it? No. Yeah. Gosh. And we were about to have to do that again. And we didn't have the funds for that. I mean, so did I think that God could get those funds if we needed them and he wanted us to stay? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I had no, I mean, the funds wasn't a thing, but it was an issue to think about and how effective everything was and and then having those family issues back home especially. Right. uh, I feel comfortable telling you is is my mother. Um, So she's living with us now. And uh, she moved out of her apartment and is living with us. And uh, we're going to eventually buy a house right. with her. So we're going to take care of her. And uh, that was kind of the straw that broke the camel's mm-hmm. back, so to speak, was um, my mother's situation. So, yeah, it was very difficult. It was not something we wanted. And I've, I'm still in this uh, kind of weird spot where I'm applying for jobs is actually a really great time to apply for jobs because no one wants to work, but <laughs> I do. Uh, so <laughs> uh, that might have been a political statement. I'm not sure about that. I think it was just an observation. Oh, okay. And I think right. that's okay. Okay, good. That's um, okay. Yeah, so. Yeah. I will say, like, I fully believe that God brought us to London for such a time as this. Um, the fact, like, Aaron and Jennifer were not the Browns, the IMB missionaries, weren't plugged in a church, and they weren't feeling like they were a part of a team. They felt very abandoned and alone because the diaspora team um, had slowly dispersed, which leaving them to be the only two still left in that area. So um, to be able to make the acquaintance between them and Ridley, it would, like, if we wouldn't have come, they would have never gotten that. And I think the work that they can do together with Martin is right. going to be powerful if, in, for the name of the Lord. So. And, and also, right when we came in, Ridley was going in through a transition of becoming their own autonomous church. Right. They weren't just a church plan anymore supported by ELT, East London Tabernacle. They were a full-on autonomous church, which took a lot of paperwork, a lot of organization, a lot of administration, things like that, which I helped Martin with. And now it's a full-blown autonomous church with new missions, uh, identity, with preaching. And so those two things coming together, we feel like we accomplished something through the strength of the Lord. No doubt. Uh, Pretty incredible. God did it all. It was nothing that we ever planned for, you know, uh, none of that. And so it's, it's amazing talking about it, and I love it, and we uh, are so glad that you guys gave us the opportunity to do that. Uh, you guys were instrumental in that and in giving me my first ministry opportunity vocationally and then financially and prayerfully and all of that. So I thank you from the bottom of my heart for giving us that opportunity, no matter how st- how hard it was, because it was very hard, great things came from it. So praise God for that. So what's next for you all? Could you tell me that? No, no, <laughs> no, no. no. We, we, I have Kristen, thoughts, but uh, don't Kristen has something <laughs> going on, and then I have other things. But you tell me what you're doing now. I am a preschool teacher, and I love it. No <laughs> so, kidding. Yeah, I teach at North Point Christian Schools. Oh. Um, okay. So that's been awesome. I also, while we were overseas, became a postpartum doula, and I'm hoping to work with something called Lighthouse Ministries, which is a home for teen moms and just being able to educate them on how to take care of their babies and help them to be successful moms. Wow. 
Okay. Yeah, and for me, yeah. I wanted to I want to stay in ministry, but also I wanted to make the commitment of not moving our kids around so much anymore. So one of the big convictions I had was same school, same church, um, because our a lot of the friends and family go to our church that we're attending, and um, that obviously logically concludes that I cannot be a pastor anywhere. So. Right. I was thinking, okay, how is this going to work, Lord? Because I do feel called to the ministry it's some, in some way, shape, or form. Mm -hmm. uh, I know that they have a lot of teaching opportunities there to do as in a, like a lay position. But God, again, put this amazing ministry slash secular job. It's kind of secular where it's a social studies teacher for high school students that are expelled or in uh, some kind of gang relation or legal trouble or right. in and out of jail or they're living at uh, a residency called Wed Wedgwood Christian Center mm -hmm. um, that they are living there because they can't live anywhere else um, besides jail. So <laughs> uh, right. that's what I'm applying for. I'm in the process. I've not gotten that job yet. But right. that's a great way for me to do ministry, right? right. right. But also not needing to leave my church yeah so one of the one of the reasons i wanted to have you here is obviously any excuse to be able to hang out with you guys is is gold but um i mean i, I think a lot if you were to take a poll of folks that were going through things at church i mean they were here not only here at church but just anywhere i mean there's there's joys there's there's challenges and all what always amazed me about you both is that even with the challenges you I know you had questions about what God was doing I know you were wondering okay God why are you putting me in this place but it was almost as if your faith was growing stronger even as that was going on and that sometimes that just doesn't make sense to a lot of nope, us so it doesn't. I, I guess what I want to ask you just if I if you just permit me one last question what would you say is the number one lesson or the number one thing i know it's probably hard to sift through because probably a lot of things that you that god taught you but through this whole process what would you say is it immediately remember oh. that song cast all your cares upon you yeah. lay all your burdens down at your feet yeah that yeah trust we have the tendency to like to go back to the altar and take the burden back off and carry it like okay let's put it there for a second yeah. and then if you do that, it's n it's never going to work. You have to leave it there. <laughs> there. We, as sinful people, try to control things. And Dwayne here one time told me, I only worry about what I can control, and that's nothing. So I loved that, but then that plays that's out. pretty good. Yeah, I know. <laughs> uh, that plays out when you start, and that was one big thing, is every morning I'd try to wake up at 4 o'clock, so I could have at least two, three hours of Bible reading silently. And that was just my lifeblood. It, every single text pointed to trust. Yeah. Uh, yeah. If we try to do it in our own strength, our own power, it's going to fail. Right. I mean, even if it succeeds... It may, it's it's just a temporary success, but the eternal victory is really in Jesus Christ. That's right. So I'm hoping as we've had this conversation, we spent a lot of time le learning about the ministry that they had over there. But the takeaway from all of this really is, no matter where you may find yourself, and a lot of you, you may be finding yourself in a valley right now. Um, he's promised. In the, in the shepherd's psalm, he's promised that even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil. Why? It's that one promise that's all through Scripture. I'll be with you. I'll be with you. I'll be with you. I'll be with you even to the end of the age. And um, I, I, I so appreciate not only you sharing your ministry, but being living testimonies of that as well. And uh, you were, even though you were all the way over in uh, London... You all were not far away from us, and uh, I hope you felt that. I hope you knew that, and I know um, Sam. weren't you? Didn't, didn't you get up with him about once a week? Even, uh, even well, he was, stayed up late. Yeah, for me. Yeah, and I got up early, so it was the exact opposite. So there were some connections that were there. 
Scott and Kristen are going to be here for a little bit in case you wanted to get to know them a little bit, uh, a little bit better, and then we'll go grab a bite to eat and, and such. But why don't we just have a time of prayer, and we want to pray for you. And then, um, and then the, as, as that happens, the music team will come forward, and we'll um, have a time of commitment. If, you, if there's any commitments that you need to make, regarding the fact that God has called me to trust in him. Even with all of this that's going on, he's still proven to be God. And he's still proven to be our Savior that rescues us from our brokenness. Maybe this is the morning. You've heard the testimony. This is not just something that, you know, is just one of those things that you, you know, here today, gone tomorrow. Christ has promised to be faithful. No matter where we may find ourselves, he's promised to be faithful. And I want that for you. I want you to know and to live out in his faithfulness, all right? Father, thank you for Scott and Kristen. Thank you for, Lord, the faithfulness that you have demonstrated through them. Lord, you can tell that they left a big part of their heart in, in, uh, in England. And, Lord, now they're looking to see what, uh, what is next with their life's work and, and your life's work in them. But, Lord, I just love how there's more than one way to accomplish kingdom work. And I thank you, Lord, that we can come and we can be a part and be encouraged that even through the joys and through the challenges, we see, Lord, that there is an example, Lord, here that we can see and we can talk to and we can hug and we can get to know better, Lord, that there is an example of your faithfulness. If there's anyone here who is going through these struggles and they want to know who this Christ is that sustains even in all of this, Father, I pray that this would be the morning that they would trust in Christ as Lord and Savior, that this would be the morning that they would be rescued from their sin and their brokenness, and they, through the bloody cross and the empty tomb, would be rescued to your goodness and your faithfulness and your purpose and your design for their lives. Father, guide us. We love you and thank you in Jesus' name for his sake.